Today, it's the story of a singer-songwriter who risked everything to take down a cheating record label. Uh, he risked his finances, his reputation, his future in music, even his mental health. It was all on the line. But the alternative was something a lot worse. I mean, working under a dishonest contract that was more or less musical servitude. Going bankrupt in the process, this fearless artist took his label to court while at the same time writing and recording what many considered to be his masterpiece. And along with that album, a scorching rocker that history would never forget. Find out how it all played out with an interview with a member from the legendary band coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. And make sure to subscribe below to get the stories straight from the legends, the rep button. It's Tom Petty, backed by the Heartbreakers, taking on the man with their album, Damn the Torpedoes, including today's song, Refugee. Nineteen seventy-eight was looking like a great year for Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Uh, it consisted of guitarist Mike Campbell, drummer Stan Lynch, bassist Ron Blair, and keyboardist Ben Montench. The band was developing a devoted fan base. Their self-titled nineteen seventy-six debut had reached number fifty-five in the U.S., number twenty-four in the U.K. The singles "American Girl" and "Breakdown" both broke the top forty in seventy-seven. It was during an era when you know disco dominated the charts. Now, when they released their second album, you're going to get it, and that was on May 2nd, uh, 1978, it was clear that Tom Petty's music was the next big thing. Now, this sophomore record jumped 32 spots to number 23 from the last album, went gold, and thanks to the singles, Listen to Her Heart, and I Need to Know. Everything is okay. Putting numbers and accolades aside, there's just something in the air. You know, music lovers and the industry players alike could feel it. Album number three from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers was going to be a commercial smash. Unfortunately for Tom, his label Shelter Records, led by owner Denny Cordell, they recognized this too. And his response was to tighten up control over Tom's already unfavorable recording contract. When Tom Petty did the math, he realized that he was being ripped off. Imagine that, a label ripping yeah. off an artist. He was reportedly making something like a penny per record. Unbelievable. Said Tom Petty, I think I knew I was in a bad deal after that first record. We had started to sell significant amounts of albums or gold records. There should have been dough. We hadn't taken a big advance and our costs weren't that high. Where was the money? Now, until that point, Tom and Denny had actually been good friends, but as they say, you know, business is business, and Denny would not budge on that contract. By early 1979, things got even worse. Uh, Shelter Records distributor ABC was bought out by MCA, allegedly giving MCA ownership over Tom Petty's contract. But Tom didn't buy it. You know, He argued back saying that his contract was non-transferable. He pointed to a clause stating that ABC couldn't sell his contract without his consent. Uh, the paraphrase, Tom Petty, uh, he said, just because you have $35 million doesn't mean you have permission to buy someone's business, their music, or their life. Now, Tom Petty had absolutely no confidence in this new regime. Now, feeling like his career was in jeopardy, he decided to fight back. First things first, he got to work on the next album without MCA's financing. Uh, he began by paying what he could out of his own pocket. He was later you know, fortunate to connect with non-MCA record executive Elliot Roberts. He fronted Tom that money to record the album, and he bankrolled part two of Tom's plan, which was taking MCA to court to nullify his contract. Roberts also encouraged Tom to file for bankruptcy, which he did in May of uh, 1979. Now, this would play a pivotal role in Petty's legal strategy. A high-stakes hearing was set for August. You know, if the court ruled in Tom Petty's favor, he would be a free agent musician. But if not, MCA would own Petty's music and his future. The MCA desperately wanted to release Tom's next album. They knew Petty was a you know, hot commodity, so their lawyers began issuing injunctions, including one preventing Tom from playing his music live. Gosh. 
MCA also tried to get possession of the band's recent recordings and filed motions to force the court to, to seize the tapes. According to Tom Petty, MCA was ready to release the album even if it was unfinished. In response, the band had their roadie and guitar tech Bugs Wydell uh, hide the tapes. And this happened at the end of each session, he would hide the tapes. That way Tom would testify that he didn't know where they were. And MCA at that point couldn't claim them as evidence. Gosh, MCA really wanted Tom Petty and then they pulled all this crap with him. Fortunately, in the courtroom, Petty's legal team started to make headway as uh, MCA's attorneys lost ground. When lawyers interrogated Tom about what equipment he owned, uh, Petty explained he had an amp and some guitars. When they asked what kind of guitars, Tom replied, uh, there's a red one and a black one. The judge actually laughed out loud at that one. It was hard for anyone to have any sympathy for MCA who looked more and more like villains every single day. Now, as the hearing pressed on, MCA started getting really nervous. So did Danny Cordell. He knew that things weren't gonna go well. And one day while Petty was on the stand, he watched Cordell come in and take a seat in the back of the room. And after listening to Petty's testimony, the record executive got up and left and he didn't come back. Later that night, Cordell called and he offered to settle out of court. Now, as we continue to break down this classic hit, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. Uh, make sure to check on the latest deals that they have at zenny.com. This is where you design the look and they deliver them right to your door. So with the help of music executive middleman Danny Bramson, the two sides brokered an agreement. Tom was released from his contract and he signed under a newly created subsidiary uh, that was made just for him as Backstreet Records. What Tom Petty said about it is that Danny Bramson's solution was to ask them if he could form his own label there at MCA. And they made me a new deal and I would stay at MCA, but under the banner of Backstreet Records, uh, where I would have complete creative control. I could pretty much operate without having to report to anybody besides Danny Bramson. I felt better about it because I was with a guy that I knew and I trusted. Finally, uh, the legal madness and maneuvering were over, and Tom Petty could focus on finishing his third studio album, uh, which is aptly named Damn the Torpedoes. Let's take a second before we get into his music and recognize a true American hero, Tom Petty. I mean, he always stood up to the man, the bully, the elitist. Love him. So getting into Damn the Torpedoes, with MCA in mind, the album's title paid the homage to American Civil War Admiral David Farragut. He allegedly ordered his men into the Battle of Mobile Bay with the call, Damn the Torpedoes, full speed ahead. It turns out Tom Petty had been just as resolute. I mean, he powered through heavy fire when the stakes couldn't have been higher. Now, when the album was complete, it was both the breakthrough that everyone had expected and a masterpiece that they'd never forget. It's released on October 19th of 1979. It's 36 minutes and 38 seconds of pure rock and roll victory, freedom. The record was co-produced by Tom Petty and Jimmy Iovine, and it featured the singles Don't Do Me Like That, here Comes My Girl, even The Losers, and today's song, Refugee. The album rose to number two on the Billboard 200 album chart, and it stayed there for seven weeks. It was actually kept out of the coveted top spot by Pink Floyd's powerhouse double record, The Wall. Imagine that. A time where Pink Floyd and Tom Petty were at the top of the charts. Man. Hey, teacher, leave kids alone. Damn, the Torpedoes went triple platinum in the U.S. in 2015, making it the highest selling Heartbreaker studio album. Uh, though later, Tom Petty's 1989 solo venture, Full Moon Fever, would surpass it at uh, 5 million. Of course, her 1993 Greatest Hits collection has sold 12 million in just the U.S. Let's dance with Mary Jane. 
In that moment, for all the hell that he went through to get it done, Tom was pleased, very pleased with how damn the torpedoes turned out. Now, reflecting on the record, Tom would say that he didn't intend to come off as adversarial on tape. His exact words were, I wanted to present torpedoes as a collection of love songs, not lawsuit songs. But I guess that sense of persecution was just inescapable. I'm still bitter about some of that stuff. All those sleepless nights, sitting up in my house wondering, what is life? I'm going a little nuts. I never got into one of those places before, and I refuse to ever go back there. End of quote. All right, let's get into Refugee, an abrasive, blistering rocker that's widely regarded as one of Tom Petty's best songs. That's saying something. The second single from Dan the Torpedoes it was released on January 11th of 1980. Although it is a, a love song of sorts, it's also emblematic of the ordeal that Petty and his bandmates had just passed through. It conjures up a, a spirit of defiance when he sings, you don't have to live like a refugee. With lyrics like, honey, it don't make no difference to me, baby. Everybody's had to fight to be free. Refugee would be one of the first in a, in a long line of rebellious rockers throughout Tom's career. Stop now, when it was released, Refugee was embraced as an anthem that, that validated the spirit of America, no matter the adversity. You know, you get back up and you fight. Now, up to that point, listeners didn't know much about Tom Petty. Refugee would help set the tone for Tom's mystique going forward. Coming on the heels of his legal battle with MCA, Refugee really gave audiences and the press you know, something to latch on to. This was Tom Petty. As far as writing it, Mike Campbell was the man who got things rolling. Uh, Mike Campbell came up with the music for Refugee and he passed it on to Tom Petty to, to pen the lyrics. Although Mike wasn't sure that Refugee would be a hit when he wrote the, the basic chord structure, he thought maybe it could be. Of course, everyone in the studio knew it was good when they heard it, but as it turns out, it was actually pretty hard to nail down. You know, it actually sent Mike Campbell to his breaking point. I was really fortunate to get to interview Mike Campbell recently. Uh, such an honor. And we talked about Refugee, so uh, I'm gonna let him tell the rest of the story here. Tom was going through, as I understand it, two lawsuits at the time, possible bankruptcy. Uh, that's what I love about him. He always stood up to the bullies. And just a gutsy rock vocal and searing guitar lines on classic rock standard Refugee, produced by Tom and Jimmy Iovine. Tell me about that one, how it came together. I've always written, but uh, it, I was in a phase around when Jimmy Iovine showed up. I was writing. I had a four-track by that point, a TAC four-track. And Refugee was realized on that four track. I had a, a Gibson uh, gold top and I wanted some chords to practice playing lead with really. And I just threw those chords together. And made a little demo and uh, showed it to Tom. You know, I was just lucky with that one. You know, he really, he hit it right off. You know, he goes, I know what to do with this. And Jimmy heard it and he goes, that's it. You know, we got a record now. We have that song. If we do nothing else, we've got a record. And it was just, um, I was so blessed that Tom heard that character in those chords. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. It's, a, it's one of my favorite songs. And it's, it, it holds up, you know, those lyrics hold up today. Well, he found a way to make the chorus lift up without changing chords. That's amazing. Uh, that's a good point. And when I was writing it, I made a point of I want the chorus to have the same chords as the verse. And hopefully the singer will go up or do something with it. And of course, you know, I had the best writer in the world and uh, he did that. So you well spotted. I always read that it took a long time to actually cut the track. It had hard time getting the feel right tell me about that that was you were very frustrated it was hard you know because uh demos i don't know if you're a musician or not but sometimes you make a demo of a, the idea the germ of the song and it's inspired and it's got this feel and spirit to it 
And then you go in the studio with all the bells and whistles and you try to recreate that moment that was off the top of your head. And it's sometimes hard to get back to that. And we would just struggle to get, get it to feel as good as the demo. And I don't know why it was so hard because it's a simple song, but it just took a while to get it to float just right, you know. And uh, it nearly drove me nuts that one. <laughs> but we did finally get it right. Tell me why you wanna lay there. The only time that you really ever done this in your career where you had to walk out and, and go away for a little bit. I did. Yeah, it's uh, the only time I've ever done that. But it's like after 70 takes of Refugee and none of them sounded good. I just threw my hands up, you know, I said, look, I, I can't do this right now. I got to get out of here. You know, I went away for a few days with my wife and uh, cleared my head out and came back and we knocked it out pretty quick. So uh, I knew uh, deep down that I needed to get away, to step away to come back and, and get back to it. Well, of course, number 15 on the charts, but so much bigger than his chart position, still played every day on uh, radio stations across America. And, and like you said, a, a song for today more than ever, the lyrics. I mean, everybody's had to fight to be free. I mean, that's just Tom. It's so simple, but it's just so true. You know, it's the truth. And everybody can relate to it, I think. Now, in addition to peaking at number 15 on the Billboard Hot 100, Refugee also reached uh, number 11 on the Cashbox chart. In the Netherlands and Australia, it came in at number 24. In Belgium, it went to number 23. In New Zealand, it reached uh, number three. And in Canada, it came just short of claiming the crown. It peaked at number two. Surprisingly, Refugee has not seen a lot of media placements over the years, although in 2008, it, it did appear in The Wire and had multiple appearances in the Romanoffs in 2018. Great to see. Not surprisingly, however, Refugee has also been covered a lot of times by a lot of musicians. I'll just give you a sampling. I mean, Bob Dylan teamed up with Tom Petty in 86 to do it. Local H has covered it. Uh, Melissa Etheridge. Bad Religion. Dave Matthews, Emmylou Harris, Patty Griffin, and Steve Earle came together to cover it uh, just a few years back. Weird Al, without any shenanigans, did a straight up cover of it in 2018. Sister Hazel has uh, covered it multiple times, and of course, there's also Mike Campbell and the Dirty Knobs in recent memory. Refugee. Looking back on that decisive year, you know, 1979, the pressure that was on Tom Petty, it was massive. There was trying to, to write an album that would break the band into stardom, you know, figure out how to finance it, challenging one of the biggest record labels in music in court and going bankrupt in the process. All those things together. Could have ended his career for sure. But it's no surprise to anybody familiar with Tom Petty, his integrity, his music. This man was no quitter. He's tough as nails, even though the, the legal skirmish with MCA almost finished him off. Mentally and financially, he pushed through it. I mean, Tom couldn't fathom a world that would let a, a faceless corporation silence a solitary songwriter, albeit a songwriter with the utmost integrity and conviction. And there was no way that Tom Petty was going to let that happen. He could stand him up at the gates of hell, but he was never going to back down. Yeah, I went there. But as much as any rock star that's come before or after Tom Petty, he was the voice of the people. And he had the heart of, of the everyman. Gosh, I miss him. Leave us a comment about Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers and Refugee. What did you remember about this song and about the rest of this incredible album? Is it Tom Petty's best work? If not, what is? Let's, let's get a good discussion going below. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our other Tom Petty installments uh, with and without the Heartbreakers. We've got you covered for sure. Uh, Tom Petty's one of my favorite of all time. If you would take a second and subscribe below, we'd love to have you as part of our community, always trying to keep the music alive. That's what it's all about. Until next time, three chords.
and the truth, my friends.